Okay, let's begin. So I found this uh, very interesting quote. I did not know that Einstein wrote about socialism, but he has written a book called Why Socialism? And I will read a paragraph from it, just some few lines. The abstract concept of society means to the individual human being the sum total of his direct and indirect relations to his contemporaries and to all the people of earlier generations. So this particular quote also sums up the idea of a category yeah, that the individual is in fact the sum total of the interactions, the external behavior. Yeah, so I just wanted to note that. There are other interesting quotes also if you want to have a look. Okay, so uh, we have started with category theory. Over here, we defined the notion of a category as some data. Yeah, this is the structure and together with some properties. And uh, we have seen some examples also. Yeah, for example, category of sets, category of groups, abelian groups and all the algebraic ones. Then category of topological spaces, metric spaces with appropriate morphisms. Here there was an exercise that Lipschitz continuous maps, yeah, the composition of two Lipschitz continuous maps is again Lipschitz continuous. Yeah, that's an exercise in analysis. And we saw one interesting example where objects are just positive integers and home sets are matrices, R cross R matrices. And uh, then we saw that if you take a single object small category, then it is nothing but a monoid because there is one specific morphism called the identity morphism. The composition becomes multiplication and that is all you need. Okay, And I, we ended with the question as to how can you think of a set, a single set as a category. Does anybody have an answer? Huh? Two objects, okay. That will be a set, okay. But we want like more categorical properties. So, I mean, that's fine, I guess. Like you are recovering that as a home set between two objects. But we want something more, like a more uh, prevalent category theoretic construction. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Can we find morphism of A to B equal to functions from singleton A to singleton B? Functions from singleton A to singleton B. What's the meaning of functions from singleton A to uh, I mean, that will be just one function. Uh, morphism, a collection of uh, morphism of A to B equal to only one function. ordered pair. But we want a single set. So how is it giving us what we need? Singleton set as a category. Okay. So you are basically saying home singleton comma A is, isom uh, is a set A. But I would still say that this is an external piece of data. Yeah you are treat, getting a home set as a set in both those solutions. But if you want that information embedded inside the objects themselves, I think you are trying to uh, uh, generalize this idea of a monoid. Yeah, that is what both of you were doing. Any other ways? Objects are on the elements of the set and only identity morphisms. Only identity morphisms okay? So this is called a discrete category. So let me write that example. A category is C is discrete if only morphisms are identities. 
So then using this definition, I can say that a small discrete category is a set. Yeah, I mean, that's all. You don't have anything apart from what is absolutely necessary. Yeah, identities you can't get rid of. Every object must have identity and you just have that bare minimum. Okay, so this is what this condition is. You can obviously have large discrete categories. They are not sets, but they are proper classes. Then uh, say that a category C is a pre-order if home C A B is a singleton for any A and B in objects of C. Okay, so this is a pre-order. In particular, uh, when A is equal to B, so home C A A is a singleton. What can that singleton be? It has to be the identity morphism. Yeah. Then there is at uh, sorry is sorry is at most a singleton. I mean, is a singleton or empty? I. So home C A A must be singleton because identity is always present. But otherwise, we do not have any other restrictions, right? So uh, the other restrictions are. So if let's try to analyze this situation, okay? So uh, yeah, first uh, first thing, if home C A B is non-empty, and home C B C is non-empty, then what can you say about home C A C? It's non-empty because the composition. Don't say transitivity yet. Yeah, this is also non-empty. It is basically transitivity. Yeah. So whenever, so when you interpret that home C A B is non-empty, you say A is less equal B. Yeah. So rewriting home C A B non-empty as A less equal B, we get reflexivity and transitivity. Why reflexivity? Because home C A A is non-empty, identity morphisms are present. And the property that I wrote above, it says that it's transitive. So reflexive and transitive relations are not necessarily sets. Yeah, I mean this is a it can be a small pre-order or it can be a large pre-order. But this is called a pre-order. Now, in a pre-order, however, there is one condition missing from the usual thing. This is an order relation. So usually we think about partial orders. Yeah, so what is the difference between a pre-order and a partial order? Yes, sir, there's no anti-symmetry. Anti so it can happen that there is a morphism from A to B and there is a morphism from B to A. So we have to quotient out by such things. Yeah, so these are uh, isomorphic objects. Okay, and we have to quotient out by such objects and then we'll get a poset or a partial order. Yeah, I'm poset is a sh is an acronym for partially ordered set. But it doesn't have to be a set. Yeah, it can be anything. We are, I mean, this is uh, an important thing about foundations like the, the standard foundations, namely set theory, that you don't really need the concept of a set to talk about functions. 
yeah every set mapping to its cardinality now that's not a set function then uh, so the uh, concept of a function and the concept of a relation is more fundamental than the concepts concept of a set right so therefore a pre order is just a pre order order relation is more fundamental than it being a set like there there being an underlying set so it can be a pre order which is small or large it can be a partial order which is small or large and now that we have started talking about an isomorphism like quotienting out by isomorphism so let me define what an isomorphism is a morphism f from a to b in a category c is said to be an isomorphism if yeah tell me some ideas if there exists a g you can't say i mean normal our our isomorphism is oh it should be injective it should be bij surjective like bijective maps which are structure preserving but there is no bijection concept here there is no set there is no function yeah we are just talking about a morphism if there is some g from b to a such that no f of g doesn't equal sat correct so gf is equal to 1a and fg is equal to 1b so it must have a two sided inverse yeah so that's an isomorphism now i'm going to go back a bit and i'll show you this thing again now look at example 6 again and in that example 6 we said that morphisms of c we are talking about a small single object category suppose i put a, the condition that every single morphism is an isomorphism what will i get a group okay so a group is a small one object category in which every morphism is an isomorphism more generally i am going to give you a, a a ninth example a groupoid is a category in which every morphism is an isomorphism i am not going to write isomorphism always yeah i will just write an iso every morphism is an isomorphism okay so basically you can go from uh, i mean yeah there is also notion of connected groupoid connected groupoid means home is non empty for any pair of objects yeah uh, a groupoid is connected Uh, i'm using word g is connected if if g ab is non empty for all ab in objects of g so basically every single mm, object is essentially the same like it's if any two objects are isomorphic to each other but still they are different yeah being isomorphic doesn't mean they are equal in fact equality is not the right notion in category theory at all yeah everything has to be up to isomorphism but here there are many copies of this okay a in particular yeah in particular a yes a group can be thought of as a group but i was going to write that yeah a single object 
small groupoid is a group. This is actually the definition of a group, if you wish. Yeah, single object, small groupoid. But a groupoid can have many objects. Okay, one, uh, one instance, like this is for those who know the subject. Yeah, this question is for those who know the subject of algebraic topology. Have you heard of the fundamental group of a topological space? Yeah, how, what do you assign it to? Is it just an arbitrary topological space or something more than that? A base topological space. Okay, so we want to go in that direction now. So we are going to do another set of examples and then we will talk about the fundamental group and fundamental groupoid. Okay, so uh, set star is the category of pointed sets. Pointed set means it is a set comma one element. So obviously everything here is a non-empty set. Yeah, so objects of set star are pairs a comma a where a belongs to A. Capital A is a set, small a is an element. Right? So that's that is this category. And then what are the morphisms? So set star A A, comma B B are all functions are functions from A to B such that functions f from a to b such that it preserves the base point. Okay, so this is set star. Pointed sets and pointed set pointed functions. They should preserve the point. I mean normally you can do, do it with any concrete category. I mean roughly speaking I will define a concrete category later on in the course when we study functors. But uh, loosely speaking, a concrete category is one where the objects can be thought of as sets with some extra structure. Okay, So, this is set star and similarly you can like top is obviously a concrete category because topological spaces are sets with some extra structure. So, we can talk about top star. This is the category of pointed topological spaces and maps preserving the base point. Okay, so you can do it with any concrete category. Yeah, we don't need to worry about just sets and topological spaces. Every group, for example, always has a base point. You can always think of it as the identity element. Monoid also has a base point. Right? So, now, once we know top star, then we know that fundamental group, every, every uh, x comma x naught in top star, an associated fundamental group we call it pi 1 x comma x naught yeah, because it has to do with what are the uh, elements of this group if you can tell me equivalence classes of loops at x naught yeah but uh, what equivalence classes pathomorphic equivalence classes very good i am not going to write down the details of that and what is the group operation 
path concatenation but path concatenation is not an operation on its own it's only a binary operation up to homotopy equivalence yeah so remember that okay in fact given x in top we can associate a fundamental groupoid uh this is denoted by capital pi1 of x now what is this groupoid so how many objects are there whose objects are pi1 x x0 where x0 is an element of x it is still in bijection with what i said earlier so these are our objects and what are the morphisms yes morphisms are homotopy yeah but we also need some operation of composition so homotopy classes of of paths between base points so tell me when is this fundamental groupoid connected when the topological space is connected is not the correct answer path, path connected yes when the topological space is path connected then this fundamental groupoid will be connected otherwise it won't be okay understood this part if you don't know algebraic topology i don't expect you to know these things these are not important but i have to be comprehensive while i am doing examples yeah i i am just trying to show you that the more fundamental object than fundamental group is the fundamental groupoid Yeah, because every point, uh, the fundamental group depends on the base point. So for every point, you associate the group. Yeah. So therefore, this will work out. Well, well. Now that we are on this topic, let me uh, do eleventh example, and that is. H T P Y, the category of homotopy. equivalence classes of morphism so objects are topological spaces and morphisms are homotopy equivalence classes of maps of continuous maps we will come back to this particular example when we will study concrete categories okay any questions so far okay so then uh, let's do one more example it's slightly different so suppose t is a formal theory so we are doing an example from logic suppose t is a formal theory and phi are uh, yeah the objects uh, we define a category we are yeah we associate a category deductions over t of deductions the objects are formulas and morphisms are hilbert style deductions
वॉट इज कंपोजिशन कंपोजिशन इज कॉन्कैटिनेशन ऑफ डिडक्शन एंड आइडेंटिटीज आर वन लाइन डिडक्शन If you don't know what they are, don't worry. Okay, examples are never going to be important to understand concepts in this course. Yeah, but for those who know this, you we are we are doing it. Fine, fine. Yeah, I mean. deductions up to t yeah i mean t is the set of non logical axioms we are given and we are doing everything up to that let's <laughs> fine correct yes nupur you have a question no okay well some other examples that we can do i mean uh, we have to get this image of a function being a morphism out of our brain we already saw one such example where matrices were morphisms objects were just positive integers so uh, this is example number 13 now this is the category rel yeah this is the category of relations so objects are sets themselves and morphisms are relations so given a set a so uh, can you tell me what is rel ab subsets of a cross b very good if i write this you yeah relations are all a cross b uh, subsets of a cross b power set of a cross b okay so relations themselves can be thought of as morphisms because they have a direction sense of direction right a and then b how do you define compositions compositions of relations yeah so if r is a relation from a to b and s is a relation from b to c then s composed with r is defined to be all those pairs a comma c in a cross c such that there exists some b in b which connects those two yeah such that a comma b is in r and b comma c is in s so that is the composition of relations what is uh, i mean in this sense what is the identity identity relation is i mean the diagonal identities are diagonals yeah okay Yeah, but have you seen composition of relations before? Yeah. Okay. So uh, another example of a similar kind, we will call it part. The smallest reflexive relation, right? Which is just the diagonal relation, a comma a. so part is the category of partial functions so objects are sets and morphisms are partial functions perhaps you have not seen this concept so partial functions are relations where yeah i mean partial function is r subset of a cross b such that if a comma b belongs to r 
and a comma b dash belongs to r then b is equal to b dash so to every element so normally the definition of function is that to every element of the domain there is a unique element of the codomain so we relax that condition on the domain whenever for some element in the domain there is an element associated with it in the codomain then that is uniquely determined yeah, so no existence property but uniqueness property that's partial functions okay any questions so far okay then i am going to define a new way of generating new categories so if c is a category then define the opposite category c op by declaring objects of c op equal to objects of c and home and for any pair of objects for any pair a comma b of objects of c and a morphism f from a to b in c we take a morphism f op from b to a in c op so what's happening we start with a morphism in the original category and we formally invert it formally reverse it yeah just reverse the direction this will also turn out to be a category yeah so basically we have to know suppose we are talking about 1c yeah what is the op of 1c if it is empty then the set of morphisms uh, from i mean b to a you are saying set of morphisms from b to a is empty in category c then the set of morphisms from a to b in category c op will be empty we have one to one correspondence between morphisms from a to b in c and morphisms from b to a in c op you simply change the notion of domain and codomain swap it so if one set is empty then so is the other but the other dual version yeah not the same version so what is one c op if c is an object then what is one c op it just one c yeah because the domain and codomain they don't change and if you are taking f op composed with g op then that is g composed with f op yeah so this is way of formally reversing the directions this concept is really useful in orders because you simply reverse the orders now let's let's look at one particular example so let's consider the set of natural numbers with less equal relation what are the objects of this category natural numbers and what are the morphisms between natural numbers less equal yeah so this is a pre order less equal yeah if n is less equal m then only there exists one morphism otherwise there exists no morphism so it's either one or nothing okay now what is n op so we are going to say m less equal op m which means 
yeah the what is this that n op n op nm is non empty if and only if m is less equal n in the original category which is saying that n nm is non empty so we are formally inverting everything so it's the greater than equal to order yeah less equal op is the greater than equal to so it often times happens like for example consider the collection of all posets the collection of posets is closed under taking opposites taking the dual category do you agree with that yeah because dual of a poset is again a poset dual of a linear order is again a linear order and in general also there could be many classes of categories in which this particular property is true that if a category lies in that class then so does the opposite category so for such categories actually we can reduce lot of our work via a simple principle simple yet powerful principle called the duality principle okay so i'm going to state it now yes sorry sorry this is this is wrong this is m m to n yeah i made a mistake while writing this thank you yes okay so i am writing down this very simple looking principle but it's very powerful because it reduces our work in half okay suppose x is a class of categories closed under duals yeah i e if c belongs to x then c op belongs to x by the way when i am talking about dual then i implicitly assume that all of you know what will be double dual what is it just the original category yeah it's a map whose square is identity what are such maps called not ad importants ad importants are maps whose squares are themselves yeah f square is f involutions yeah so duality is an involution okay so suppose x is a class of categories closed under duals if p is a categorical property true for all categories in in x then so is p op the property obtained by reversing all arrows and compositions so what i am saying that if prop if one property is true for a class of categories closed under duals then the opposite property is also true now there are some natural questions here let's see if you can ask them do you understand this statement exactly we have not defined a categorical property <laughs> yeah so that is something we need to do now 
I, mean, I haven't given you any examples, but duality principle is nevertheless valid. Okay, so let us look at an example of a categorical property. Okay, so one example, say that an object T of a category C is a terminal object if Home C A T is a singleton for each object A of C. Okay, so we are defining a terminal object. So there should be only one morphism to T from any object, including T itself. T to T is, there will exist one morphism at least, which is identity. But in general, there could be many morphisms. So we are saying that identity is the only morphism from T to T. But that is just the tip of the iceberg. Yeah, I mean, we are saying that home A T, if any morphism, there is a unique morphism from A to T for any T, any A. So can you give me examples? Let me go back to uh, slide number uh, 5. Singleton sets in the category of term. Yeah, this category of sets. Because how many functions can you define from a set to a singleton? A single, function. A single function. Yeah, because every element has to be mapped to that element. Okay. Let's just be extra careful here. What happens if your domain happens to be the empty set? Empty function. Yeah, because what is a function? A function is a triple. Domain, codomain and the graph of the function, which is a subset of domain cross codomain. Now, if the domain is empty, codomain is singleton, then the cross product of them is empty. So what can be a subset of empty set? Just the empty set. So therefore, it is also true that there is a unique function from empty to a singleton, the empty function. Okay. So always think about these corner examples, extreme examples. So I'm going to write it uh, this using this. So a singleton I mean, it doesn't matter what that singleton is, yeah. I'm just denoting it by star, but any singleton is a terminal object, okay. What about groups, the category of groups? Identity what? Identity element? No, identity element, identity morphisms, they are not correct answers. What are the morphisms? Group homomorphism. So we need a group, trivial group, not identity element, trivial group. Think about where you are. Yeah, that's so trivial group. Trivial group means group containing only one element, namely the identity element. So that is a terminal element, uh, terminal object. Abelian groups. Trivial group, yeah. Are vector spaces one dimensional? One dimensional R vector space. Is that unique? Like, is home RR singleton? 
singleton zero zero vector space trivial vector space yeah you can't say that <laughs> r is not itself a terminal object uh, that's not correct what about category of rings unital rings does there exist a terminal object zero ring i mean it depends on our choice yeah most likely unital rings we ask them to be non trivial yeah zero and one are different so in that case there is no terminal if you allow zero to be equal to one then it can exist okay so i will say there doesn't exist a terminal object category of monoids and monoid homomorphisms again trivial trivial monoid yeah singleton just identity semi groups again don't say identity trivial group semi group homomorphisms yeah remember that if you say singleton semi group then can you make sure that there is a semi group homomorphism from any other semi group to itself yeah let everybody be sure you are saying no okay homework try to figure that out yeah single uh, then modules it's the same thing yeah trivial module yeah so i'm not topological spaces S empty empty space is not terminal point single uh, singleton space with what i mean do i need to describe the topology on singleton space <laughs> is discrete and indiscrete different on a single chain no it's unique yeah so singleton space just that metric spaces single chain i want everybody to verify all these things okay mat r does there exist an object which is terminal i did not include zero objects are positive integers there is no terminal object good a monoid thought of as a category is there a terminal object depends on the monoid there exists a terminal object if and only if the monoid is trivial yeah otherwise not okay good discrete category does there exist a terminal object if and only if the set or the discrete category is single object category yeah then pre orders what is a terminal object in a pre order no not least element it's maximal maximum element yeah it's a maximum element over here yeah what's a maximum element that everything is less equal that if it exists yeah i mean i'm not saying that maximal elements exist i mean you can see that in these examples terminal object may or may not exist yeah so even here yeah pre order will have a maximal element if and only if Well, I mean, not if and only. If. I mean, it if it has a maximal element, then it will have a terminal object. Otherwise, it won't. 
ओके अ ग्रुपॉइड नो डायरेक्टली नो सी फर्स्ट ऑफ ऑल रिमेंबर इफ टर्मिनल एक्सिस्ट देन द कैटेगरी इज कनेक्टेड या कैटेगरी इज कनेक्टेड मीन्स द अंडरलाइंग ग्राफ ऑफ इट इज कनेक्टेड यू कैन गो फ्रॉम वन ऑब्जेक्ट टू अनदर ऑब्जेक्ट वाया a zigzag of morphisms you can go along morphisms or opposite ways of morphisms so therefore terminal exists means this is the star yeah everything connects to this so therefore the category is connected so if the groupoid is not connected then there is no question at all but if the groupoid is connected then also a terminal object will exist if and only if the Home sets are singleton, and there is only one object. Or okay, yeah, home sets are singleton. That's all. Trivial thing. Yeah, that that's okay. Yeah, so terminal exists if and only if all home sets are singleton. Set star. Does there exist singleton set with what point? <laughs> there is only one point. right so it always exists so that is singleton star comma star okay uh top star same thing yeah i'm not doing that then well let's not go into these awkward things category of relations do it as homework yeah figure out tell me next time whether it has a terminal object or not okay and if c has a terminal object what will it be in the dual category initial object very good so you know the definition so now uh, i will define an initial object using a different color so initial object if home c i a i mean this is i notation is i is a singleton for each object a of c it's the dual property so existence of a terminal object is a property of categories it's a categorical property so if now look at the duality principle again if the class if a class of categories is closed under duals and every single category has a terminal object then every single category also has an initial object yeah so that's what the duality principle does it gives you the dual property for free now i'm going to use this blue color and we are going to figure out initial objects in different categories okay so uh, in the category of sets what is an initial object empty set okay uh category of groups trivial group okay abelian group same maybe same may not be same if they coincide then that is called a zero object okay so we will write that so uh, category of sets doesn't have a zero object you can see that empty set and singleton are obviously different not isomorphic then trivial groups so category of groups has a zero object category of abelian groups has a zero object then category of vector spaces has a zero object category of unital rings does that have an initial object z why suddenly z right everybody should think about it that zero should go to zero under a ring homomorphism and where can one go
one has to go to one yeah and then that will be uniquely determined if it is a unital ring with zero not equal to one then that morphism is uniquely determined because what is an arbitrary integer n if n is positive it is 1 plus 1 plus 1 so because it already preserves addition so image of n is automatically determined yeah f of n is equal to n times f of 1 right so that's determined so z is actually the initial object in this uh, modules it's the same again topological spaces does there exist in an initial object in this category empty space okay matrix spaces and matrices empty space fine provided i mean we have to think about whether there is any condition no it's uh, Lipschitz continuity is fine with that. Okay, then a single monoid, let's leave that discrete category, leave that. Yeah, the, it's the same answers. Uh, when does a pre order have an initial object? It's a minimal, minimum element if exists. And set star singleton again. Yeah, so this is also a zero object. Okay, then let's leave these things. Relations I will give you as a homework problem and part. And the dual of initial object is obviously the terminal object. So, let me write that a zero object, an object uh, zero is called a zero object if it is both initial and terminal i mean here i am already giving you the notation zero is the notation used for zero objects so in any pointed category usually the single point is a zero object yeah? so groups are pointed automatically now one thing that we need to observe let me go back to this slide so, how many terminal objects are there in the category of sets? Is it unique? There are so many. Yeah, any singleton would work as a terminal object. So, basically the idea is that the ex uh, existence does not guarantee uniqueness. But we never need uniqueness. We need uniqueness up to isomorphism so let's go to that slide and let us say if t1 and t2 are terminal objects in c then can you conclude something about t1 and t2 they are isomorphic how do you conclude that then home t1 t2 is singleton okay then then c c t1 t2 c t2 t1 are singletons let me write that yeah so t1 to t2 let's say there is f and t2 to t1 there is g and we know that there is one t1 the identity morphism and there is one t2 the identity morphism over here and these are the only maps 
possible between these two objects. So therefore, G composed with F has to be a morphism from T1 to T1. But there is only one possible, namely identity. So therefore, G composed with F is equal to 1T1. We are forced. And F composed with G is also 1 sub T2. So therefore, F and G are inverses of each other. And it, they are both isomorphisms. So basically, the objects are isomorphic. So terminal object may not be unique but it is unique up to isomorphism. Initial objects also need not be unique, but they are unique up to isomorphism. Okay. Now, there is one thing I, I want to show you. Yeah. We want to write this in the form of a diagram. We always, were, I mean, the, these, are, these are spatial cases of something more general that will come later. The categorical properties that we always desire are called limits and co-limits. And this is a simple thing about uh, like terminal objects are limits and initial objects are called co-limits. Uh, let me go back to a particular example. So this is groups, abelian groups, vector spaces, rings, monoids, semigroups, etc. So associated to each one of them, there is some signature. Yeah, I mean, for example, for groups, we saw yesterday that it's a binary operation, then a unary operation of inverse and a constant symbol constant which is nullary operation. Then abelian groups also there is something, same thing MIE. For vector spaces there are scalar multiples, uh, scalar multiplication maps, the unary symbols. Then monoid semigroups, modules. Then you can also add to this list yeah, uh, the categories of post sets, partially ordered sets and monotone maps between them then pre-ordered sets and monotone maps between them, then lattices uh, and monotone uh, and lattice homomorphisms between them, Boolean algebras and Boolean algebra homomorphisms between them. So all of these are algebraic examples of some kind and I have combined them into a single example too for a reason because we can write them, if sigma is any language or signature, then all of them can be written as sigma structures or models of certain theories, like they satisfy some properties. So sigma structures and sigma structure homomorphisms, they will also form a category. Yeah, sigma structure just means like if your language or signature consists of one binary function symbol, then you are taking a set, non-empty set or just a set with uh, a binary function defined on it. Now, homomorphism means it should just preserve that. Similarly, you can do something with relations. So those who are interested in logic, they can understand that sigma structures and sigma structure homomorphisms, that's an important category to understand. And similarly, if you want some properties present, then you uh, write down those properties as axioms and those axioms will form a theory. And then the category, the, a subcategory of this, which we call category of models of a theory, that will also be a category. I mean, these are some more examples and they en encompass lots of these examples under one umbrella. Any questions about this? Okay, then now finally, we haven't finished with the examples of categories yet. So let me write one more example and that is this cat. The objects are 
small categories small categories means the collection of morphisms is a small set and morphisms are functors between them okay so this is a new term functor now try to recall what russell's paradox was russell's paradox said that the collection of all sets is not a set but here we are doing that yeah the categories themselves could be objects yeah here we are taking a restriction that these are all small categories but they themselves could be objects and then there are appropriate morphisms between categories which make them into a category this will be a locally small category and there is also another category that we will consider here which is objects are locally small categories and morphisms are functors like many books reference books they will call it as a quasi category but we don't need to worry about that it can be a class i mean it it will be a class, I mean because it kind of is a class in the, the problem is like usually in practice people want to work with locally small categories and if you take one locally small category and another locally small category and take all functors between them then that's not a set so it's not locally small but it's still a category you can do the same things because in a category we always work with it contains a lot of classes which makes it some like so that's why i said if you are worried about the foundational issues then you should start with a universe of sets set theories yeah, yeah? so for example von neumann universe like v0 v1 v2 where the notion of a class and set are relative but in general you shouldn't worry about that i'm just giving you two notations and uh, the point of talking about these two examples is that our next point of study is going to be functors yeah functors are the natural morphisms between categories and what should they preserve if i go back to the definition then they should take objects to objects so there should be two categories they will take objects to objects then they should take morphisms to morphisms they should preserve domain they should preserve composition and they should preserve identities the, these properties are irrelevant yeah properties are never preserved by structure preserving homomorphisms so it should just take objects to objects morphisms to morphisms identity to identity and composition to composition so that's your definition of a functor and we'll begin with that next time mm -hmm.